I'm going to take just a couple of minutes to try to clarify a little bit um, some of the concepts that Shira Wolowski is working with in the Poetic Voice chapter. Wolowski makes a distinction between poetic voice and poetic voices, and that can sometimes be a little confusing. Um, so I want to use the, the materials that you've already looked at, the Johnny Cash video titled Delia, and the two poems by W.H. Auden to kind of walk through a little bit of what Wolowski is, is trying to get at. The video that you watched by Johnny Cash, uh, Delia's Gone, um, if we talk about the speaker in that poem, or in that song, I'll probably refer to it as a poem here. So, the speaker in that poem, how would you describe that person? Um, the words that come to mind for me are bitter, vengeful, awful, horrible, and yet I think most of us understand that this man with this cute little kitten did not really tie a woman down and shoot her and end up in jail talking to the jailer about how he is haunted by her ghost. Um, we understand that Johnny Cash is creating a fictional poetic voice to speak the words in this song. So this is what Shira Wolowski is talking about when she talks about four voices in the dramatic monologue. She uses the uh, Robert Browning's poem, My Last Duchess. But applying the same logic here, in Delia we have several voices. We have the speaker, who is a yeah, let's use the word insane murderer. Uh, we have the audience for the speaker, who for much of the song may just be the, the speaker himself, but by the end we understand that he is hoping that the jailer, or assuming that the jailer, overhears this. Importantly, both of these are fictional. Neither one is in fact real. But also, as Woloski notes, Johnny Cash himself is a speaker in this poem. He wrote it, and he published it for us to, to be able to hear. And then, of course, we, the audience, are another voice. We bring our own experiences to this particular poem, and we add those experiences to what Johnny Cash has sorry, that's going to bother me, to what Johnny Cash has written, and that contributes to the poem's meaning. So this is kind of what Wolowski is talking about when she talks about multiple poetic voices. She's going to go on, though, and say that it, it actually goes, it becomes even more complex than this. Um, a dramatic monologue is kind of an extreme case where what we have is clearly a situation where the poet is creating a fictional poetic voice. How does this work with a lyric poem, though? Um, one where we sense that the poetic voice is much closer to the poet's voice. I think that the two poems by W.H. Auden illustrate how even when we feel that the poet's voice and the poetic voice, the speaker and the poem, are similar, it's really not fair to assume that the poetic voice, the speaker's voice, is necessarily equivalent to that of the poet himself or herself. In Stop All the Clocks, the poetic voice basically says, morning is essential. Someone I love has died. The whole world should completely come to a stop and pen pay attention. In Musée des Beaux-Arts, the speaker is much more stoic. Suffering happens. People die. Get over it. Both of these are poems written by W.H. Auden. Both poems are ones in which we might assume that the speaker in the poem, the poetic voice in the poem, is equivalent to Auden's, and yet they're radically different. And I point this out simply to say that even if we do want to say that the poetic voice is the same as the poet, we have to remember that a lyric poem captures one moment in time, and it is a reflection on one particular moment or event and that it is certainly not the totality of the poet's 
point of view. If we want to talk about W. H. Auden's understanding of death and suffering, we've got to account for both of these poems and a number of others. But Woloski is going to say that even in a poem like Musée des Beaux-Arts, there is more than just the poet and the speaker and the audience. There are other voices that come into play. So what are some of the other voices that show up in this poem Musée des Beaux-Arts? Well, we begin with this line about suffering, they were never wrong. So we know that Auden is entering into a conversation with someone, they. Well, who is the they? The they, the old masters. And if you know anything about art history, the old masters are the paintings, for, the painters from the, the Renaissance era, the ones who kind of brought a new life to the visual arts. Um, then as we keep reading, we get to this line, for the miraculous birth. Well, what is the miraculous birth? Most of us who know Western tradition would understand that to be the birth of Christ. So there, the Christian mythology of the birth of Christ becomes another voice in the poem. Critics, though, have noticed that we can get a little more specific than this. I'm going to show you a series of paintings by Peter Bruegel, who is mentioned down here. Um, this is a poem about the birth of Christ. And... It, it, yeah, it doesn't quite look like it. He's painting it from a very northern European perspective. Um, and we read this, while someone, how suffering, it takes place while someone else is eating or opening a window or just walking dully along. How when the aged are reverently, passionately waiting for the miraculous birth, there must always be children who did not especially want it to happen, skating on a pond at the edge of the wood. Well... Here we see children skating on a pond. We've got the aged people here reverently waiting. This painting, in other words, that Auden critics generally agree was clearly referring to in the beginning of uh, Musée des Beaux-Arts, is one of the voices that comes into the, the poem itself. As we go on, They never forgot that even the dreadful martyrdom must run its course, anyhow, in a corner, some untidy spot where the dogs go on with their doggy life and the torturer's horse scratches its innocent behind on a tree. Well, we don't really have any torturers here. Um, I'm not sure that there are any dogs, and there doesn't seem to be a horse scratching its behind on a tree. For that, we have to go to another of Bruegel's paintings. And here you see a dog going about its doggy life. Another one over here. Um, generally, it's this horse right here, down in the right-hand corner, that critics think is the horse scratching its behind on a tree. Auden's taking some poetic license there. So this painting about the slaughter of the innocents, um, I think from Matthew chapter 2, I might get the chapter wrong there, this also becomes one of the voices in the tree, uh, in the uh, poem. And then we get the final part about Icarus falling from the sky and drowning. This is from this painting right here, Landscape with the Fall of Icarus. And if you look at this, a lot of people could stare at this painting for a long time before noticing down here this pair of legs sticking up out of the water where Icarus from Greek mythology, if you remember, he, he and his father made wings out of wax and feathers to escape a prison. And the father said, don't be so prideful as to fly too high or your wings will melt and you'll fall. Well, he did just that and he drowns. Um, and this is the painting that the final part of the poem refers to. And you can see how in the painting we do see this idea that the suffering is happening down here. Everyone else is just kind of going on about their lives. Uh, so this painting, too, becomes a voice in the poem. So the voices in Musée des Beaux-Arts, we have a speaker, we have Auden himself, we have we the, the readers, but we have the old masters, we have Bruegel specifically, we have three separate paintings, we have Christian mythology, we have Greek mythology, 
we could even go so far as to say that we have I'm going to use the term here, sorry. Other people who have written what is called ekphrasis, which is writing about artworks. There's a whole tradition in which poets and other writers have written about paintings and other art objects. And Woloski would say that those two become voices in the poem. And that if we're going to fully understand this poem, Musée des Beaux-Arts, we need to be aware of all of these voices uh, and the ways in which they contribute to the poem's meaning. Um, so we have poetic voice and poetic voices. Usually, just to clarify, when you hear poetic voice, singular, This is what we're talking about. If someone asks you to analyze the poetic voice of a poem, they're really looking for you to analyze the speaker in the poem, who may or may not be similar to the poet. And we have poetic voices. And this is Woloski's idea that we need to account for all of the voices that enter into the poem. Both of these are very important concepts, I think. Um, I think Woloski is absolutely right that this does give you a fuller understanding of the poem. <coughs> but I also want to call attention to the fact that this is a particular poetic term that you need to be aware of. I hope that this helps to kind of unpack a little bit what Woloski is talking about in this chapter of The Art of Poetry. And now I'm going to ask you to put this idea to work on some of the poems written by Charmaine Cadell.